Welcome all to Back Pass with Russ and we are here with a continuation of our Euro special, our first ever collaborative episode with our friends at the Bola Bola show. So if you missed it, please check our Facebook page, Twitter page, our website as well. We've got a website now. All our episodes are on the website so you can check out part one where we covered Euros in the 90s. Today in part two, we'll be looking at Euros from the noughties, which is 2000, 2004, and 2008. So before that, let me just reintroduce the guys from the Bola Bola show, Elvin, Bala, and Steven, the dudes from Clang. How are you guys, and are you excited to get this going? Hey, Ras. Hey, good evening, guys. Yeah, fantastic, man. Looking forward to it. Yep. Yeah, I like Russ, the energy. Uh, yes, a very exciting moment. First time I'm coming guest to your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. First energy. of many, I hope. <laughs> yes. Very, very excited. Very excited for today's podcast. And in fact, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, very, I would say, uh, nostalgic in our previous episode to talk about Euro in the 90s. And I'm sure we will uh, revive similar feelings of Euro in the noughties as well. All right, fantastic, Steven. Well put. It was really nostalgic and I think the episode could have gone on for hours. In fact, we had to but, just... But Russ, before yep. we proceed further, I think there was one important thing that we missed in our previous episode. Something which the moment we finished recording and I went to bed, only I realized that we forgot to talk about this. In right. all the Euros that I've, I've watched, there's never been a better anthem than Three Lions from Euro 96. Oh yes, football's uh, coming home. Yes, football's coming home. Yeah, I, yeah, you are right. You missed though, it. Even though it's um, a more, I would say, connected to England, but somehow or other, you know, I think among all the Euros, I mean, I don't know what was the theme song for all the other Euros, but uh, <laughs> hosted by non-English speaking nations. Yeah, it's like a Eurovision competition. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you know, the, the three lions, uh, you know, uh, Skinner, Bollier, and uh, the vocalist from this band called Lightning Seeds, it's mm-hmm. still today one of the most remarkable songs, in my opinion. Yeah, they might be singing it again this year. I'm putting my money on them, actually. Oh, <laughs> all right. Okay. So anyways, let's get back to the year 2000. So we'll start off now with segment one with Euro 2000. The year 2000, guys, June 2000. I know you guys were all 20-year-olds at that time. But what were you all doing in your life at that point of time? So we'll start with Bala. Well, me and Alvin, I think we just completed our diploma and uh, going towards the uh, degree. So, well, you know, normal uh, teenager life, you know, in between of uh, becoming adult, mm. we're still in a childhood mindset until now. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, that was the uh, one of the memories, especially in the, during our. I remember, Alvin was waiting for me in the bus stop. For, for hours, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, so it was basically uh, you know going to college together. You know, we we're in the same college, and uh, yeah, I used to wait at the bus stop. Uh, in fact, I think for hours, I think for Bala to, to arrive at time. So definitely, uh, you know, those those were the days, like you know the the early twenties. You know, mm. uh, getting getting hold of the driving license, taking my father's car, mm. <laughs> going all the rounds. Spinning around, you know, with Sivan and Bala as well. Like, yeah. so, so those, those were the young and free days. Like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which college were you guys in? Uh, college Damansara Utama, KDU. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. So that's where you got your diploma then? Yeah, diploma and then degree as well. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sivan, yourself? Well, uh, about six months before that, I just finished my Form 6 exam. Oh, okay. And, and so for practically eight months, in the, in my, the, the first eight months of the new millennium, I was pretty much living a very happy go life. Uh, I wasn't working yet, didn't have a job, nothing. I, mm. I was looking, looking for something here and there, but just never materialized. So, you know, my, my, day, my daily activities is always, uh, you know, I'll go to bed probably somewhere around four or five in the morning and wake <laughs> up at one in the afternoon. That's pretty much how my day was during those those eight months. You know, really having at the time of my life, uh, you know, such a carefree moment. You know, enjoying things. You know, you know, and uh, and of course, uh, you know, when Euro happened, I barely didn't miss any game. I watched pretty much all the games in that tournament, that, mm. especially Euro two thousand. Mm. And of course, you know, on that first day, I think Elwin and Elwin and I will have a story for you because we were watching in one guy's house. 
it, it's not even his house, not even my house, not even our friend's house. It happens to be our friend's ex-girlfriend's house. So we oh. were watching at, his, at that particular house, the first game between uh, uh, Belgium and Sweden, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. That's an interesting story. I, okay, let's keep that for later. Uh, anyways, guys, remember the year 2000, we overcome the Y2K bug as well. So the world didn't end. Yeah, yeah, it did. Plus, like, uh, Carlos Roa probably ought to rethink his decision <laughs> and all this. <laughs> How about you, Russ? What, what you Yeah, what about you, man? Okay, I, I was 16 years old at that time. Mm-hmm. And um, around the tournament, I had the honour of representing the Gris Milan Sikh Union in the annual Malaysia-Singapore Sikh Games. Um, oh. In our community, is known as the Gudwara Cup. So I had the honour of that. And we played in that tournament using the Euro 2000 ball as well. So... Oh. Um, so yeah, that was me in around that time of Euro 2000. 16, okay. Mm, interesting, yeah. man. Yeah. So, I mean, for those who do not know, I'm half Malaysian. So I was representing Nagris Milan through my mother's parentage and because she is Malaysian. And uh, if you do not know, I, I, for myself, I consider myself more Malaysian than Singaporean because of the family ties there and the links I have with the country. So... So it was a proud moment for me that, that time there. Mm, you must miss Nagri Samilan, Nagri Samilan a lot now, bro. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Massive, massively, yeah. yeah. Not just Nagri Samilan, everything, the whole Malaysia, KL, and yeah, even, man. even nearby JB as well. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, so going to Euro 2000, the tournament proper now. Elvin, a question for you. Which team disappointed you the most? Well, I think when it comes to Euro 2000, it has to be Germany, right? You know, mm. the way the way the you know as defending champions, you know, they were eliminated from the group stage. You Bottom know, the, of the group. Yeah, and then the squad, you know, at that time, interestingly, only had one player below the age of 25. One, okay, and <laughs> his name is Sebastian Deisler. Okay. Ah uh, yes. And yes. and. Yeah, and the squad, of course, add Lothar Mateus at the tender age of 39, I will put it. Okay. <laughs> so, so this, I mean, this this really showed uh, what German football was at that point of time, like, you know, lack in youth of, in youth development, you know, and uh, the coach is the coach as well, you know, Eric Rebeck, uh, he kind of showed some favoritism towards Mateus that caused uh, some sort of unrest in the mm. camp, you know. Mm. But of course, there was another side of the story where they say, you know, there was a coup to overthrow the coach and replace him with Matters before the tournament. So, <laughs> very, very bizarre, bizarre moments, you know, indeed in German football. But, you know, to me, I think it has to come down to the organization la, of, uh, of, of this entire German team. And uh, Matters as well, you know, he did, uh, he did come out after the tournament was over you know and he and he was basically pretty much disappointed uh, you know with the whole thing you know and then he mentioned i mean i'll just quote and unquote what he say you know he, mm. he said that you know uh, we must look very closely at the character of our players you know it will be better to use less talented players who actually put their hearts into the game mm. and are proud to play for germany you know there must never be another german team in which every player earns millions but not ready to give their all so you mm. know pretty Pretty strong words there from the from the legend, lah. Mm-hmm. But you know, uh, yeah. Having having said this, I think that this was definitely a turning point, you know, in Germany's uh, Germany's history, lah. Right? Yeah. Because uh, you know they had to go through this entire process here, you know, and um, to 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 actually see the the fruition of this of of the uh, project of developing uh, young scouting network and youth talent which will eventually you know win them the 2014 2014 world cup so you know along the way many things happen but uh, yeah just to answer your question uh, the most disappointing for me is germany yeah germany was at the end of the era the players that you know won the world cup and won the european championships in the 90s Yes, they were, they were all getting a bit long in the tooth they were you know getting old and there wasn't an a fresh batch of talent coming through and you know that was the result of that disappointment by Germany and I would say in that same group as well England I would put their name in the in it as a team that disappointed you know remember they were playing well beating Portugal and then Portugal bamboozled them yeah. beating them and they did beat Germany I think that was one great victory for them but that was probably a game between two poor teams and then 
last game against Romania got knocked out. Our friend Phil Neville had to be the villain to <laughs> give away the penalty late in the game and uh, Romania deservingly knocked England out. So I think England was another disappointment in that tournament. Yeah, yeah, indeed England as well. Yeah. yeah. So from disappointments we go on to the co-host because Euro 2000 is actually the first international tournament where you had two hosts and one of the hosts Holland or the Netherlands were, were one of the favorites to win this tournament and they had on paper a squad that could match the French, you know, players like Van der Sar, Stam, the Boer brothers, Overmars, David, Seedorf, Burkham, Clivert, and they were managed by a legendary figure as well, Frank Rijkaard, former winner in 1988, finished top of their group ahead of France, and they hammered Yugoslavia 6-1 in the quarterfinal. That made them heavier favourites to win this tournament on home soil. So, Sivan, question for you. Did you think Holland picked too soon in the quarterfinal or were they just unlucky in the semi-final against Italy? I think it was clearly unlucky lah, because uh, if, you, if you remember the game against Italy, mm. it, it was pretty much a one-sided affair. Holland were pretty much attacking right, pretty much from the first, I mean, right after the first 10 minutes, all the way to extra time, to penal, all the way until the, the beginning of the penalty shootout. They were pretty much attacking, they were dominating the game. And don't forget, they missed two penalties. Yep. How on earth did you miss two penalties in one game? <laughs> Francesco so, Toldo. So it's, I mean, one is Francesco Toldo. I mean, uh, did both yep. he saved? One, one, one was the post. One was the post. So <laughs> it's it's purely unlucky. If In fact, I think, uh, you know, it's just one of those situations where I think, uh, you know, the Netherlands just happened to push the panic button, you know, when they tend to choke at when it really matters the most. And now that squad had every potential to go far and could have won the Euro. But, mm. you know, I think uh, when what happened against Italy pretty much, uh, you know, build up subsequent years of uh how do i put it underachieving in international football especially when the fact that that same squad that went to the world cup qualifier and even missed a ticket to korea and japan mm, pretty, yeah. pretty disappointing i would say i mean you may, i mean like what mentioned uh, elwin mentioned is germany but i would think netherlands also were pretty disappointing for me in that tournament because they had every every reason to win it it was just purely unlucky they couldn't do it in that semi final against italy and italy that showed their true class in defensive football Yeah, as as you would know from the previous episode, I'm an Italy fan. So for me, I remember Germ- Holland were heavy favourites going to the semi-final. In school, all my classmates were tipping Holland to beat Italy and you know, nobody regarded Italy highly because of the way we played football, you know, very defensive, counter-attack. So nobody regarded that as, a, you know, as something fantastic because attacking football was the thing people wanted to watch and that's what was regarded highly. So, but as an Italy fan, it was sweet to beat Holland under all the circumstances in that match because we were playing with 10 men for most of the game, which is why we probably were on the back foot. Um, two missed Dutch penalties, as you've mentioned, Steven. One saved, one luckily missed. And then finally winning a penalty shootout after watching them lose in that same way in 94 and 98. Francesco Totti's penalty in that penalty shootout, Wow. First time I've seen a Panenka, and that was it and, uh, from Totti. And we are still we are still searching for Jabstam's the, the penalty. Ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was I was about to say that. I was about, that's the one that went to the moon. I think it went to the moon. Like it's not come down yet, bro. Jabstam's, yeah. pe- Jabstam's penalty ball. Gonzalo he go in from the 2015 Copa America, and this high player called Terasil Dangna. I think we, he missed the penalty against Malaysia. All oh this yeah, yeah, balls, correct. It's in the moon, bro. Somebody better go and collect it. <laughs> so many balls in the moon. And 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 uh, and guys, you know, just just because you all mentioned Toldo right in the game, I I. Mm. I I mean you have a look at the way the goalkeepers saved the penalty back at that time they are not going to have it so easy in this time you see how far off the line oh, yeah. they, they come they come out during the shootout right and they, you see Toldo save as well when you look at it he was really I mean he he definitely was way off the line but at that time you know the rules were different lah yeah, huh? yeah, so yeah. it would be a very different story so that's why nowadays is very hard to actually save penalties you see Mm. I mean, that's yeah. a very interesting uh, opinion there a very interesting twist to that story yeah true mm. that is if it's played today but it was not it's played yeah. in 2000 yeah, exactly <laughs> uh, but also I think the trickery or the art of uh, this kind of thing I think first I think goes to Uruguay second Argentina maybe third in Europe I think Italy right? 
<laughs> for what? For what kind of uh, art of dark dark football? Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. That that is true. That is true. That Italian dark art of defending and you know all the sneaky sneaky games that they play in the game. Yeah, yeah. That is. I have to admit that. But yeah, that was the semi-final. Anyways, Bala, next question is for you. Anyway, so hang on there. Um, France, the champions, they were great in this tournament. I would say they were stronger in this tournament than they were in 1998, and they played a very dramatic final against Italy. Overall, I would say they were deserved winners of the tournament. But in terms of the final, do you think Italy should have won it in 90 minutes? Well, the result says two one. Uh... Yeah. In the 19th minute, I think uh, actually what uh, what his name Silver will talk scored yeah. in 93rd minute. So in yeah. 19th minute they did one, but uh, three minutes to uh, the referee extended the injury time, and perhaps the last kick of the tournament. Uh, sorry, the last kick of the game, and then uh, Toldo. I think he rather than use his hand, I think he should lay, use his leg. The mm. reflex. I think he's uh, made him to go down rather than if he used the leg. I think should have more. Uh, Easier for him would have kicked the ball, but whatever said, another goal still a goal. Yeah, uh, I would say yeah, Italy. Actually, Italy was coming out of ages, uh, especially after the 1990, 1998 uh, World Cup. I think they lost to France again in penalty shootout. Yeah, in so, 98. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I think so. I thought they got revenge and they played well with the squad. You know, Del Piero. I think he also ballooned the one of the chances he had. Yes, true. Two big misses by Del Piero. Yeah, so I think he also had a, a horrible game. Totti, I think, was the was the star from the way mm. he played. Uh, I think he was young, he was energized. His movement was fantastic. You know, even the goal he scored by Marco Di Belcio so was nice. Yeah, But, he was actually the man of the match, Totti. Yeah, so as I say, he was played very well. Just that, the, and then Trezeguet, I think Juve just signed him. And what a way he scored! <laughs> that, that, that goal is still, uh, I think, one of the best goal I think he scored in the international game, especially with this uh, touch, tall guy. And uh, yeah, I think end of the day, I think France deserved the win. Uh, mm. If you ask me, Italy deserves the win? Yes, they do. But we can't have two winners in the same tournament, right? Yeah, of course. Yes, uh, we mentioned last week about golden goal, the introduction of golden goal in the Euro '96. And this was another one that was decided by the golden goal, but it was less fumbly and less clutchy, if you could say, because this was really well hit by Trezeguet into the roof of the net. And right. I think in that game, I think once that equalizer went in by France, I think Italy's heads dropped. They were not in the game at all after that. So it was just probably a matter of time before France scored. Because yeah, the, psychologically, you, I think they were devastated, lah. Because yeah. the, the equalizer came, I think, like what, 30 seconds before the final whistle. Yeah, started, very, very, very late. And uh, yeah. you know, if you were, if you were to score a golden goal, that's how you score it, man. <laughs> yeah. No, but having said that, you also must understand that the game. I think towards toward the tournament going time, if Iran's Kanovaro was uh, yellow carded, I think towards the first half. Mm. So that's only psychologically. Of course, they played well. Of course, Kanovaro is still a Kanovaro, but uh, the the game was slightly disrupted by that. So you used to have three center back. I think remember yeah. the game was uh, Kanawa Nesta Giuliano. Yeah, he's one of the guys. And who, Nesta. Yeah, Nesta was there. Yeah, Kanawa yeah. Nesta Giuliano. And yeah. Maldini was in the left. So yeah. And so it kind of disrupted the movement. And if you realize the guy who like a defensive midfielder, I think even recently Manchester City lost a tournament because one of the reasons they lost the uh, there were two proper league defending midfielders not even playing. So in this mm. case, uh, Luigi Biaggio wasn't was taken out. I think at the 66 minute to Amber Rossini, compared to Big and Amber Rossini, I think I prefer Big in terms of the uh, aggressive aggression. Yeah, yeah, the Biagio, yeah, correct. I yes. I think also that semi final probably took a bit out of Italy because they had to last a long time with 10 men. Yes, and so, yeah. so I think tactically also Italy, I think made some error. I think mainly because they want to defend their one zero lead. Yeah. If you ask me, Big would have stayed. He might have made some different. If I ask me, he was the uh, change. And also Stefano Fiore, if you can, if you can recall. Yeah, mm-hmm. he had a great tournament. Yeah, he would replace for Del Piero for his for info. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, that's all said and done. France deserving champions of Euro 2000, but we're not ending there with Euro 2000 but, uh, yet. One more thing, if I just remember the yeah. the coach, France coach Roger Lemay. Hmm. I think after the Thursday goal, I think the first time he smiled. I think. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no reactions at all, but yeah, yeah. Steven used to do the gimmick last time. I remember yeah, yeah, yeah. He used to do that. He used to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think it's also necessary to point out the continuation of France 
that whole project football because mm. Roger Lemay was the assistant coach in 98 yeah. under Amy Jacque so he actually so it was actually a, a, a very good transition between what happened between 94 all the way to 2002 whereby you know that one generation of french players managed to win a world cup and a euro back to back remarkable remarkable achievement if you ask me but by that standard if you ask me yeah they were the first to do it in that order in fact yep. so seven and elvin you got a story for us on euro 2000 please share with us the story of watching the the, the match in our friends uh, yes that's the one our friends Girlfriend, ex-girlfriend's house, no? In fact, if he if not, it would end up being his father-in-law's house. So, yeah, we were there. And yeah, see when you want to highlight more things. Well, actually, uh, Raj, maybe you, you might want to know how we ended up watching the final because uh, when uh-huh. Italy, when the, the match between Italy and Netherlands took place, we, it was understood that it took, uh, there was an open screen in, in Bangsa, big screen, okay. open, open air in Bangsa, and it was quite a big gathering. Yeah. So we decided, we assumed that the final was be the same thing, lah. So mm. we went down to Bangsa, and turns out there was no, <laughs> there wasn't, there wasn't any, <laughs> there there was no open air, nothing. <laughs> so we practically had to watch by side from the side of the road, because you know in many of the bars they had TVs outside for people yeah. sitting outside to watch. Yeah. But we we were sitting outside of the bar, you know, at the side of the road and watching yeah. from there. <laughs> It was only sitting inside the bar. Really <laughs> outside. Bro. Yeah, yeah, by by the divider, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That shows your commitment, man. And, well, I think uh, initially he went to a Chinese restaurant, right? That's different. The first chairs out, I think. Definitely chairs out because he wasn't bothered about the football that day. He got to close the shop, I think. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I remember watching games in uh, Chinese seafood restaurants before in Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the game, I think, I think you know, like after three a.m. something like that. Yeah. So, so yeah. after the match, we were close the shop, just chase us out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, well, I mean, like, like as what I mentioned to you, right? You know, the eight months was pretty much the carefree time of my life. This was just one of it, lah. All right, that's a very interesting story. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, not much on your first game story, but uh, this one would suffice. Yeah, and uh, just just want to point out something about Euro Euro two thousand is uh, one one team that that really uh, caught caught my attention was uh, Slovenia and the way they mm. started off the tournament. You know the yeah, the, the yeah. way these players started off the tournament with a bang. You know when they took a three nil lead over Yugoslavia. Of yeah. course, of and that course, was a derby for them, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, first major tournament, and of course, you know that game ended up three all. But you know, what an introduction like, to the big stage, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, no yeah. doubts, no doubts. I think yeah, 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 well pointed out. I remember I, them as well. I mean, you, 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 if you guys realize that, I think we, we, we learn geography a lot more through football than in our geography class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well said, man. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's either that or Miss Universe. <laughs> Mm, Even my good. auntie was asking me, you know, last time, you know, the TV one, I uh, used to show the, I think an evening show, they show you know, what the country's uh, weather. The weather? Oh, ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Buenos Aires, I think I think also Argentina. So, my auntie asking, how the hell you know all these things? <laughs> <laughs> you watch football, I don't know. <laughs> Which class, or what is it correct? Like, even, we learn more geography in the football rather than the class. Yep, yep. All right, guys. That brings us to the end of segment one, Euro 2000 complete. We got two other competitions to cover, and uh, when we come back in segment two, we've got Euro 2000 and four. Trezeguet is waiting in the centre. Trezeguet, France have won the European Championship to add to the World Cup, the first nation ever to do it that way round. Allez les Bleus! Running in the final of the European Championship, the Queen, the President, the Italian players absolutely floored. Okay, guys, we're back. Euro 2004 now, four years on. So now we all know we are in the midst of a COVID pandemic right now, uh, in present times. In 2004, there was this thing called the SARS outbreak. And I remember in Singapore, we had to take our temperature before entering any building. You know, record it down. We were given a small sticker to to place on ourselves to show that we are all well. Uh, I was in polytechnic at that time. Uh, how was it like in Malaysia, Elvin Bala, Steven? 
Actually, uh, to be honest, uh, Ras, I I can't really recall uh, temperature scanners yeah, yeah. and masks and all this during that time. Yeah, yeah, no masks. There wasn't any yeah, masks yeah. here I, as well. I, yeah, no. I, I I couldn't. Maybe maybe Singapore, uh, Singapore the way they manage it. But I don't know. Sivan and Bala, can you guys remember any such nah. thing? Right? Nothing, nothing. No, right. I mean, yeah. no, to us, life goes on, lah. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> pretty. I mean, no, I, the time I was working in the HSBC, but then I think the I think Singapore one of the country badly affected compared to Malaysia. I see. Probably, uh, probably, yeah, probably. Yeah, so, I think mean, yeah. the reason why, but then they never had any border crossing. That's one of the reasons why Singapore was so particular about this. I think, if I'm mistaken. Mm. But the star, stars came from some Wixen cat. I mean, otherwise. Uh, I think it came from Hong Kong or something. Yeah, yeah. somebody ate yeah. a cat. cat uh, like <laughs> My God, these people. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's get back to football now. Yeah. The bad is still not so bad. La. <laughs> Eating a yeah. cat. Oh, God. Okay, Elvin. Yeah. This my favorite question to ask you. Which team surprised you for good or bad in Euro 2004 and you cannot name Greece? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so I will name I'll name a good and I'll name a bad lah, okay. right? So, so you know, for good I would say since you say I cannot name Greece, Greece is the obvious one, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Since I can't name Greece, I would say Czech Republic, okay? Because mm. uh, Czech Czech Republic had a very good tournament, you know. Uh, sadly, you know, they just they just fell short to that, you know, to that typical way this Greece plus was scoring, like you know, <laughs> corner and then an unmarked header. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Actually, honestly, I don't know what happened to all the central defenders. Whenever they played Greece, you will see the corner come in and then one full hit it here. And everyone goal. know what they're gonna do. Everyone yes. knows what they're gonna do. And it always happens. And 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 the thing is, uh, coming back to this Czech guys, side, because you must admit that Milan Baros had a great tournament. You yeah, know? It, yeah, Lever, yeah. So. Five, yeah, and then and then Baros had. Carol Boboski, yeah, oh. and and you know five well taken goals, you know, and basically, uh, overall during this period, I would say from '96, you know, uh, when they made the final till about Euro 2004, uh, this one, mm, yeah. the Czechs, the Czechs were definitely no pushover like, when they entered the tournament, like you know, they're not those kind of teams that just go into like you know you normally make up the numbers, like you know, yeah, yeah. Sadly, I would say you know sometimes teams like Austria, okay, which which I always feel uh, <laughs> are, are like that, you know, these guys go into the the tournament, you know, and then end up with a boring zero zero draw, lose one mm. nil, and then they're out. Mm. But Czechs, you know, Czechs during this period, uh, yeah, I I I would say really you know proved themselves and definitely uh, surprised me for the good lah, you know. Mm. Uh, I think they smashed Netherlands and Germany also. I think. Yes, correct. Great tournament they had, like, basically, you know. And, yeah, yeah. I think this Czech team was probably. The strongest we have seen. Yeah, it's it's very. It's stronger than yeah. it's stronger than Euro '96, and then this was the best lah. He got for Czech Republic. Yeah, it was a Euro, very enter, Euro '96. I think you know it, it caught everybody by surprise, but I think by 2004, it was pretty much a very strong team. And bear in mind, guys, even for qualification of Euro 2000, Czech Republic was the only team with a hundred percent record. Hmm. Yes, but only unfortunately in 2000 they had a very tough group with France and uh, yep. Netherlands yep. in their group. They, they, I mean, it's pretty similar in 2004. They had Netherlands and Germany, but they came out on top. I mean, remarkable yeah. team, lah. Yeah, yeah, definitely true. the Czechs. And 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 uh, for the bad, I would say Italy, yeah, Ras. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so oh, you know, I, Italy, I got them as bad as well. Yeah, so Italy, you know, oh, I mean, I, <laughs> they are knocked out in the most bizarre circumstances, lah, from that group. You know, that true. Denmark and that Sweden had to draw two all. You know, it, <laughs> it had to draw two all and guess what? It happened, right? Yeah. In the, in, but in the end, I think, you know, the Italian players have themselves to blame. Like, you know, they didn't take True. their chances in the first game against Denmark. And of course, you know, they fell victim to that horse kick by Zlatan. You guys yeah. remember that? Yeah. 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 He went over Christian Vieri on the line. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Of all the bullets, right? Yeah. Not yeah. the shortest fellow on the line. Uh, I think until now he's been crucified. Right? I think there's one time Ita- all the Italians were hating uh, Kiviri for that goal. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and yeah. So I would say I would say Italy lah, Ras. But you know, uh, since you know you being an Italian fan and all that, Ras, you know, mm. uh, I would. I mean, it's very interesting character. Is you know how good or unfulfilled you think was uh, Antonio Casano's potential? You know, because he definitely was given a lifeline when Totti was you know suspended after the spitting incident. Yeah, right? that was and, silly. And, Yeah, yeah, yeah that's very silly of Totti. But then Casano had his chance to, you know, this, this, this was it. Because if Totti was playing, Casano was not going to get his chance. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think he was Italy's best player. In mm-hmm. fact, I think he he was Italy's best player in 2004 here and 2012 or so later on when they went to the final. He was one of Italy's best players there as well. Um, on Italy, 
this this just sums it up because you see in Euro 2000, Italy were going into the tournament not as one of the favourites. Nobody, you know, gave them much hope. They thought, okay, they'll be out early or, you know, not getting as far as the final. But there they were, they all the way to the final, nearly winning it. And here in 2004, they had a team that was going in as one of the favourites. Strong team on paper, a lot of star players. Mm-hmm. And then they disappointed big time out in the group stage. Even the last game against Bulgaria, you know, Bulgaria was easily beaten by Sweden and Denmark. Italy was struggling to beat them. I think the coach was, I think the time, Trapattoni. Trapattoni, yes. Yeah, I think he's the downfall, I think. I think for yeah. all his success in Juve and, and also Bayern Munich and Inter, but I think when it comes to Italy, I think he, I think he, I think he never fulfilled the, his destiny. I think maybe he's another Sachi, I guess, for them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I, have final, I, yeah, I, have to, I have to agree with that. Yeah, because I think I was also taken aback. Like in World Cup 2002, Italy played a different formation in the qualifiers, which was more attacking. Once it came to, to the World Cup, they played a bit more defensively. And then, you know, you pay your price for that. And furthermore, I think they had, they were, I thought Italy would make a remarkable comeback you know, after what happened in World Cup 2002. Yeah, but not, <laughs> not again. <laughs> <laughs> I think Germany also were surprisingly bad again. But I think this was just the transition that they were on, which started four years before. Yeah, that thing that thing needed time. That project needed time. But yeah. yeah. They, they, but they, they did surprise there, everyone yeah. by reaching the final in 2002. So maybe people were thinking, okay, never write off the Germans. Actually, if you want to talk about that, that 2002 final, I think it's uh, an overachievement lah, basically. Yeah, you yeah. know, it was a smoke screen. It was definitely <laughs> a smoke screen of German football at, at, at that time. Lah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think because, Oliver Kahn are there. Because there were lots of, you know, things that happened along the way. Remember the the 5-1 debacle to England and all that. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Okay, That's so, true. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, Steven, I got a question for you. Yep. Greece in Euro 2004 versus Denmark in Euro 92. Which team would you say deserve winning the tournament more for the way they played? Uh, to be fair, I think both teams deserve to win the tournament for the way they played. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, it's, it's, uh, you can't compare because uh, first things first, style of football-wise, maybe then I will lean more towards Denmark because they are more creative, more attacking compared yep. to Greece. But if you study, if you learn about what the Greek national team was at that time under the coach uh, Otto Rehagel, He hmm. devised a, a, a strategy, a game plan that was best suited for the players that he had at that time. And sure enough, you know, many people in the world didn't ride along to it. Many, many football critics, uh, including I remember uh, the legendary Steve Darby himself said, uh, you know, what Greece did was pretty much flush beautiful football down the toilet. <laughs> But to be frank, to be fair to Greece, you know, whatever they did, it was justifiable because with the players that they had, it was... It will be suicidal if they decide to play attacking football. Mm. It, it will be a disaster from the first game itself against Portugal. Mm. They played according to their strength. They played according to the values which they practiced the best and it paid off great dividends for them. And I don't find any fault in that. I think they deserve to win Euro 2004 just as much as Denmark deserved it in 92 for the way they played their game. You pointed out a very good point there on the way that they played based on the strength of the squad that they have. I think that is a very good point. But like what Elvin was pointing out earlier as well, everyone knew what Greece was going to do, but still, nobody could stop them. Yeah, I think I and, find and, and Portugal remarkable. And Portugal first had two bites of the cherry <laughs> hosting the tournament, right? Two more. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. They lost the first game, they lost the yes, last game. Yes, yes, yes. It was like a, you know, a bookend, you like, know, yeah. end-to-end basically. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think it was more of a, you know, Otto Rehagel outsmart Philip Scolari in the final because mm. Philip Scolari was adamant to play only one striker up front where he could have played two. And mm. that's a question mark that will, I think he will linger on his head forever because when you had someone like uh, Pauleta and Nuno Gomez, why would you choose one? Why can't you put both? Especially when you're so desperate, you're needing for that one equalizing goal. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And 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 somehow when you realize, right, guys, when it comes to these Euros and all that, when it comes, it, it's always like the Nuno Gomez time, lah. Huh? Oh. Somehow, yeah, somehow, he somehow, saved his best for that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Nuno Gomez, and 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 you know, uh, we, we we cannot forget since we're talking about Portugal as well. 
we can't uh, forget that goal by Manish versus Netherlands in the semis. No. Oh, oh that, that, yes, yes. Oh, I, I can I'll drive that, that. Yeah, that that goal, you know. Wow. Yeah. I would have preferred Portugal to win it, Czech Republic even, or Holland, for that matter, to have won this tournament. But, well, it's written in the stars, so to speak. Greece were the champions in Euro 2004. But then, uh, Russ, I uh, just want to highlight something. When a team like Greece uh, able to, even Denmark do this kind of thing, it, it gives hopes basically to other teams as well, regardless mm. of big or small. That, uh, on your you day, know, you can win it. Yeah. It's not on your day because to win a tournament, it, it can't be just one-off. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's at least about six or five games at that time. Yeah. So, it, it, with, with the right strategy, with the right mindset, with the right... Uh, With the right, right energy, I think anybody, anybody can do anything. It's just how you maximize it all the time. Yeah, true. Yeah, And so also, it's, it's, it's uh, an element of luck. Also, I believe there's always this element of luck in your yeah. favor that, yeah. you know, you goes in your favor and that's it, you know, you win it. Yeah. Mm. And and you know when Greece when when Greece won the Euro, you know there was uh, there was some news about Perak having a public holiday because uh, Greek Greek in Perak. Okay, okay, I get it now. There's a city, there's a city yeah, in Perak yeah, called yeah. Greek. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was those uh, SMS SMS jokes. Uh, that yes, uh, the days yeah. of the SMS jokes, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know, before you had social media to make things go viral. So what did you do? You send things to SMS, uh, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are SMS days, indeed. Yeah, I remember yeah. one more. Um, I don't know. You guys know this guy called Lat and his comics. Yep, Lat. Yeah. Yeah. So remember in when. Cameroon came out in 1990 because Malaysia has Cameron Highlands. <laughs> so the person drew the redrew the Cameron to Cameroon Highlands. <laughs> so that that just uh, came to my memory as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're yep. done now with Euro 2004. The next segment we're going to go at Euro 2008. So see you after this short break. Oh, it's over. It is over. Greece are the champions of Europe. The ultimate outsiders at the start of the tournament, and even at the start of this final, it's a footballing fairy story. All right, guys, the last tournament of the Northeast Euro 2008. Bala Holland made a fantastic start in this tournament. They beat both the World Cup finalists. I I wouldn't say they just beat the World Cup finalists. They wiped them on the floor as well because both games they completely outplayed. Italy and France, yeah. you know, deserving winners. But they got yeah. knocked out in the quarterfinal by Russia. Again, did they pick too soon? Uh, perhaps, but Russia also is not an uh, easy team to be beaten. I think, at uh, that time, yeah. Yes, I think Ashwin was uh, making a mark and then yeah. uh, he, was, he was, I think, he was a star, but not to say uh, one of the top. So, so I think he was making, he was making, I think after this, after this tournament, I think he was signing by Arsenal, if I'm mistaken. Yeah, he made his name in this tournament. That's true. Who's yeah. was the Russia team manager, right? Um, yes, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Yep, go seeding. Yeah, yeah go seeding. Yes. Ah, uh, so I think another strategy guy. So I think it wasn't it wasn't because of Holland they played well. I think because of uh, Russia played well. So mm. I think the credit should go to Russia more than Holland because Holland is as big they are. Uh, sometimes they tend to uh, bottle up, or sometimes they tend to what do you call that? Uh, lose focus along the way. But I think it comes with tournament because I think they did score the equalizer at the 86 minute to I think uh, when destroy. I think so they did play their part. Previous like compared to Italy, they was pounding and bounding, and the Italians was uh, having a good wall protecting. But, but this time I think they did came back. But I think Goose Hiding finally had a final say. Yeah, sweet victory perhaps for Goose Hiding against his yes. native side. Yeah. But uh, what a way! I think uh, Holland started very well. I think they very had the well. toughest group, and I think they smashed everybody. Yeah, yeah, true. I was surprised. The way this they wasn't won. A, yeah. yeah, and yeah, true. The way they won, and this wasn't the Holland of like Euro 2000 or in that you know late 90s, early 90s era. It wasn't that kind of Holland. This Holland team on paper wasn't as strong, but they had some really good attackers, of course. You know, wow, that start they made in that tournament, they were fantastic. I think similar approach. I think when they smashed Spain as well. I think in uh, uh, the recent yeah, two- the World Cup. I think yeah, this is World Cup 2000, uh, 2000, 2000, 2020. Yeah, kind of fourteen, fourteen. Yes. Uh, yeah. But along the way, I think they also failed. Hmm. 
Okay, Elvin, we spoke a bit on uh, Russia here. So the other tournament surprise was Turkey. Turkey and Russia, two tournament surprises from Euro 2008. Can you tell us about their differing styles and what impressed you the most? Yeah, so so definitely these two teams, you know, nobody nobody expected them to make the semis. Yeah, so you mm. know, for 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 Russia, basically it was it was down to three major major factors there, lah. Okay, mm. so the the first one uh, is basically Roman Abramovich, okay, because he sponsored the National Football Academy. Oh, you know, in uh, in two thousand four, you know, and this was one of the major contribution, you know, which they spent on infrastructure development, you know, and also in this process hired Goose Hiding in two thousand six. Okay, so so I would say you know the the ball already start, uh, got rolling for this Russian project. Okay, oh, is right. it Putin are for for for, <laughs> <laughs> for four, years, four years before that lah. Okay, and then and then the the so so Roman I would say Roman and his National Football Academy was the first one. The uh, second point I would say is uh, they had a very strong uh, generational talent. Okay, Andre Ashavin. Okay, yeah. He inspired Zenit, of course, to win the UEFA Cup that year. You yeah. know, 2008 on top of his game. You know, definitely one of the best midfielders you would see coming out of Russia. You know, in recent memory. You know, and then uh, of course also quite a number of players in the Russian squad was from that Zenit team as well. You know, yeah. And Ashavin, of course, you know, uh, had a killer pass. You know, he was uh, very big on artistry. You know, and mm. very good in finding balls in open spaces. So definitely, he was one of the major factor there. And you know the third one is you you cannot miss Goose Eating himself lah. You know you know the definitely the magic happens again. You know when when he is in charge, and the way actually he defeated the Dutch in the semis was uh, basically quarters quarters. Uh, yeah, the, the, yes, correct. The, the 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 way he basically defeated defeated this high flying Dutch right was he got this Russian team basically to funnel the opposition's possession. To players that are not so dangerous, okay. So that so mm. you can imagine the Dutch, the Dutch team. You had Wesley Schneider, you know, Wenderwad, you know, yeah. uh, Robin, and all these guys, right? Robin Van Persie. Yes, the, correct. Yeah. So what he did did was, is he, okay, he only made sure that first, like Nigel, Nigel De Jong, mm. Andre Huya, Khaled Bularos, <laughs> these are the guys that were getting the ball. <laughs> so so, uh, so so you can just imagine, uh, you know, they, the they guys that are not gonna hurt you. Correct, correct, okay. and 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 that's when that's when you know they really struggle there lah. I would say you know the the Dutch guys and uh, heading triumph. So that that was basically Russia's success lah. Okay, mm. in in terms of Turkey, okay, I would say Turkey was just pure drama. Okay, It's very pure, dramatic, pure adrenaline drama, and of course the Fateh Terim factor. Okay, yeah. I would say this <laughs> because just like uh, heading, you know, Fateh Terim was appointed also in. Uh, By, by by the Turkish Turkish team and uh, he also you know had another UEFA Cup sto- success story right with Galatasaray yes, yes. 2000 uh, <laughs> yes and uh, before the tournament itself uh, Fateh Terim controversially left out Akan Suko you know so so this was already mm. a starting point where people are wondering what's this fellow doing okay but Turkish must understand Turkish football uh, they were very blessed with a talented midfield you know first like Emre Belogzuglu Mm. Mid Altin Top, you know Tunkay Sanli, and of course that time Arda Turan was just coming oh, in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so and 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 you cannot forget Niat Kavici as well. Oh so, yes, so, your so, friend. So, yeah, so these guys, you know, uh, and Rustu, Rustu, Rustu. Yeah, Rustu. I, mean, like, the, I would say the uh, aging Rustu, really. Uh, uh, so, mm. you know, it was definitely full of drama because you, you just you just think about it, ah, uh, the last group match against Czech, right? It came down to a winner-take-all battle, okay, yeah. going into that match because both teams were level on every potential tiebreaker, goal difference, goal scored, goal conceded. So you, if you can imagine, in that group game, right, if that game ended up in a draw, they would needed to play penalties to see who goes through. Mm. Group game, okay. Yeah. But, you know, Turkish players just decided to make it very dramatic, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so what happened was they went two 0 down, right, with 30 minutes to play. Uh. And you know they they basically pick pick themselves up and uh, you know of course in the end uh, they won that game three two you know and uh, Niat of course you know scoring that that fantastic goal and then it basically came to the quarters is quarters as well against Croatia yeah right? yeah so that one was another dramatic one where they considered a very late uh, a late goal right and uh, basically. Everybody is. They were de- dejected because in that goal, ah, uh, Croatia first scored in the 119th minute, mm. okay, of extra time. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so and then Turkey should just equalize right after that. So, <laughs> yeah. Think, correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. 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 So you can imagine, uh, if if you are a uh, neutral. Definitely, you know, when it comes to this Turkish plus, uh, definitely is a very true, valiant effort, and uh, definitely for neutral, you know, it's pure. I would say, popcorn, murku, kwachi, you know, it's the best thing you can have while like, watching this plus in the tournament. Yeah. Never say die, spirit. Never, never say die. Yeah. And yeah. it was three dramatic late wins in a row. It started from their second group game. Correct. Second That's group right. game, third group game, quarterfinals. They 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 basically kept it very late, but yeah. they they also fell victim to a very <laughs> late goal in the semi final. In the semis, when when German plus decided to turn it around on them, lah, basically. Yeah. So and that was also Philip Lam scoring in the 90th minute. So you know it didn't always work out that way for the Turkish guys. I think they were trying to save another drama for us, but you know it didn't happen, lah. Yeah. We're also talking about Croatia team. I think I just only realized Modric was there, Rakitic was there. Yeah, it was Very a good young, Croatian young team. It was yeah. a good Croatian team. A good generation was coming through again. I think maybe yeah. they also picked. I think this in the previous World Cup. I think. I think. I think maybe. Yeah. I think the ten years, the twelve years from now. Uh no. The last time they did well in the World Cup was nineteen ninety eight. No, the last World Cup. I mean, two thousand two. Yeah, you ah. could say lah. This generation of Croatia players yeah. actually, you know, pretty much peak at the last World Cup lah. I mean, yeah. that, a lot of them came came from that generation lah. Hmm. And one thing you must remember, Fatih Tering, when he's on the sideline, it's pretty. He's a very dominant factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's They like call him it, the emperor. Yeah. yeah. In in Turkish, he's known as the emperor lah. Yeah. I think he went to Fiorentina or AC Milan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, he yeah. had time in Serie A as well. Yeah, you are right. Great memory, guys. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Elvin. Very, very insightful and uh, detailed as well. I must say, few of the things I didn't even know, like the Roma Abramovich factor in Russia. So yeah, thanks for sharing, Stephen. No worries, man. Yeah. Euro two thousand and eight belonged to Spain. They finally won something after promising for so many years. Do you think it's a long time in coming, or this was the right time with the right quality of the squad? Well, to be honest, it it was a long time coming, lah. Because uh, as you know, Spanish football, club football wise, they've always been dominant. You yeah. know, Barcelona, Real Madrid, but in, in particular, these two clubs have always dominated European football. But somehow or other, when the players come together for their national team, they don't seem to you know perform well. Not to say, I wouldn't say they don't perform. It's always unlucky. For one thing to another to another, it's always been the unlucky factor that they couldn't able to you know. Uh, go go all the way and win the tournament. I think 2008 was pretty much the right time, lah. The mm. generation of players, the style of football, which we of course later became known as tiki taka. I I think it it's uh, if you look at it, that generation of uh, players, especially like uh, uh, what's it, Ika Casilla, Sergio mm. Ramos, um, you know, okay. Zavi, Zavi, Iniesta, Iniesta, and all that. You know, they were. The most successful generation ever. They won everything at club level, and they won a Euro and a World Cup for, for their national team. I, I can't think of any other generation players, even even Zidane for that matter. I, um, did he win everything? I don't think so. I, maybe there was one or two Coppa Italia or something missing in that CV or something. But this group of players, they won everything. Everything, whatever they can win for their club, everything, whatever they can win international football, they done it. The most successful generation ever. But yeah, I think yeah. Steven, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Ah, if only Messi decided to play for this Spain team, and he well, had a choice. You know, you know I, 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 let's to 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 put it this way, lah. That's never going to happen because Messi has always made it clear from day one that he's Argentinian. That's where his allegiance is. That's where he's always proud to be. So it's never going to happen. Of course, yeah. You know, people can say, well, you know, if he have taken a call for Spain, you know, he won something and all that. But again, you know. Will that make him a happy player? Maybe not, because he he whatever said and done, you know, he was he's Argentinian, yeah. first and foremost. So that's that's where he knew what he wanted to do. He played for Argentina. Yeah, I think he would win. I mean, just say I just say he was in Spain and he won this World Cup in Euro. I think, I think perhaps I think he'll be the greatest player ever in terms of trophies. I think the one that if may yeah, I mean yeah. you can say yeah. that yeah. yeah. I would just say that um, with this quality of Spanish players in that era, God was kind that Messi was not Spanish because if he had been, it would be like a cheat code. <laughs> They've been totally dominant. As it is, they're already dominant. So you know, it have been like quite boring. You'll be watching Spain with year after year, year after year, and oh, 
So yeah, thank God Messi was in Spanish. I think for last, I think Adias. No, Spain was dominant, right? I think since 2008, then... Uh, 2008, then they won the World, World Cup, Cup 2010. Uh, 10, 12, then they won 2012. the Euros in 2012. Yep. That's so it. A span of what? 12 years you're talking about here? I mean, um, you talk about their peak level was span of six, six, to, six to four years lah, between 2006 to 2012. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but I think throughout history we can always we can always say that Spanish football has always been a, a dominant one of the dominant sides. It's just that they've always been unlucky at international level just to mm-hmm. get past that one important hurdle. You know that maybe the element of luck wasn't there or some yeah. controversial decision goes against them. Controversial, or we see like South Korean players <laughs> come back against them. You know, oh, <laughs> South Korea. Work, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because because you look at because you look at the entire history of Spain. You know, even before 2008. You know, when during the Raul days, the Morientes, the Nadal. Yeah, they always, always had the players. Yeah, players were there. Players were there to get the job done. It's always between either Spain or Netherlands. Spain mm. managed to get past the hurdle. I think they even went further. You know, two three hurdles, they jump at one go, winning major international tournament for three consecutive time, and then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. All good things have to come to an end. Yeah. I mean, and I also, I think they also break their hoodoo. I think in penalty shootout against Italy. Yes. Yes. I, I right. can remember that also because they, what the Spain had never beaten Italy in penalty or anything like that. But they haven't beaten Italy at all. In uh, international tournament. Uh, I don't recall. I remember that commentary yeah. was keep on telling when you go to penalty shootout. I think Spain will be knocked out, but I think Ike Casilla was was having a good form. I think that match he saved two yeah. penalties. I remember saying. Yeah, it yeah, hey, wasn't best of Italy as well. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, and then you know, just just something came across my mind now. You know, just you know, remember when we were talking in part one, ah, uh, yeah. where we spoke about unifying, you know, unified Germany, you know, and then a mm. potential unified Yugoslavia, you know. Yeah. What What do you guys think of a unified Russia? Would that have made a big impact? I mean, oh. all the countries that broke out of Russia, I you know, I mean. I think the Yugoslavia breakout is probably uh, it, it was probably more drastic for them compared to Russia, lah. Right? What What do you guys mm. think? Because if you look at all the Russian countries that broke out of Russia, you, you have Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Estonia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. Yeah, I would I would only think maybe Ukraine first could have made you know, yeah. Shevchenko, Rebrov, right. These guys, what, yeah. I, I mean, what, what what do you guys I, think? I think not as dramatic as the Yugoslavians. I think maybe Sivan may have something to say about Uzbekistan for us, lah. Well, you know, I think uh, yeah. I, I think overall, yeah. It, it, I I wouldn't say it's a more competitive team as a, a unified Yugoslavia, mm-hmm. but it but it could have been a very attractive team. You could have had players like uh, I mean, of course, yeah. You like uh, Ras mentioned Sergey Rebrov and. Uh, Shevchenko could yeah. have played for them. Uh, well, let's not forget, you know, Georgi King Kladzi. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Kladzi. Kladzi. Mm-hmm. He would have been eligible to play for the USSR. And then, uh, mm. what else? Marian Pahas. I, th- mm. I can think of a Latvia. Um, I don't know who else. Who else? Uh, I think Valerie Karpin, right? Valerie Karpin. In, but he did play for Russia. But he did play, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, but I think, but, but I thought he did, after that he went to Estonia, right? No, no, no. I mean, Valery yeah. Kapin, uh, uh, he was uh, Estonia by born. But because mm. uh, after the the breakup of the Soviet Union, I think he decided to move mm. to Russia for good luck mm. because he realized that the future is better there. So, mm. so, And, so, so do you think Kasimov would have made anything uh, impact for Russia, Sivan? Uh, I don't think so. Like, <laughs> okay, I mean, Kasimov, the Uzbekistan legend. <laughs> uh, okay. I mean, he's, he's a great... <laughs> He's a great player. He's a great player in his own right, but yeah, I don't yeah. think he would have made that much of impact for Russia, lah. Because yeah. they were better players. Yeah. So Russia had the squad depth in that Russia team would have been difficult, impossible for him to break through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're done with Euro 2008 now. So a bit of fun right now. This is something I love doing: getting your fantasy team together. So the team of 2000s, the Euro team of 2000s. Alvin, you want to go first? Yeah, so so for me, you know, I will go with four three three, right? Okay. So you know, uh, and and I will and I will put the player and the euro they represented, lah. Okay? okay. So 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 in this case, uh, for goalkeeper, I'll put Ike Casillas. Okay? okay. And defense, I'll have the four guys there: Philip Lam from zero eight. Okay. Mm-hmm. Russia's Yuri Zirkov zero eight was as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I have Marcel Desai of Euro two thousand. Okay. And then I have. Uh, 
Trianos Delas of Greece from 2004. A very you know solid centre back there lah. So basically mm-hmm. for my defence, midfield I'll go the three guys. Okay, so I'll have Zidane of course uh, from 2000. Yeah. Zagorakis of Greece, you know, uh, he can play a bit of defensive role as well, you know. So he'll be there okay. in the midfield, and I like Manish. Okay, all right. I, I'll put him there because he's very enterprising, a great box to box, box to box guy. So that will be my three midfielders. Mm-hmm. Uh, my forwards, uh, Milan Baros from uh, okay. Euro 2004. Uh, I will take Patrick Clivert. I I think it was he was great in 2000 Euro 2000. Yep. And uh, and of course I put Henry Ashavin. You know I I would like to see him as part of my team as well. Yeah. All right. Cool. Bala. For me, I think I'll go for a country itself. Basically, I think Italy in 2000. For me, I think that is that 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 team is still in. Uh, still is uh, one of the greatest team I've witnessed. I think perhaps because of my Syria following. I think mm-hmm. for me, I think the entire team is complete without Zidane. Okay. So I think besides that, I think if if I may to change uh, one guy, I think it would be the uh, very tough, but most likely I think I would put uh, Tukan Stefano Fiore for Zidane. Besides that, because the team at Maldi, Albertini, Luigi Biaggio, Maldini, Giuliano, I think half of the squad would join those players: Nesta, Garavaro, Conte, <laughs> Conte, and, 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 and con- the bicycle kick. Bicycle Conte, kick yeah. is the key. Yes, First yeah. game. Yep. And they don't forget Inzaghi. I remember one of the one oh, yeah. of the one of the one of the game. They said if if it, if Inzaghi were to score in his group stages, he'll be a top scorer of the Euros. So basically, he only scored half of the. I remember that the game only scored about three or four goals. The three goals by the by the group stage. So what I'm telling you now is that the entire team is fantastic. I think Pesoto was there as well. Yeah, true. Uh, I think all this classic way. I think I think we, we still be a pipe dream for anybody like that. Mm. So okay. Italian team with Zidane in the midfield. Yes. Yes. Interesting. Steven, what do you got? Okay, my formation is going to be uh, 4-2-3-1. Okay. okay. So in goalkeeper, in goalkeeper, I think in, in, in all the Euros I've seen, this, this has been the most outstanding goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Antonios Nikopolidis. Okay. So that's my goalkeeper. In right back, I'm going to choose Lilian Turam. Okay. Mm. Okay, my centre back is going to be Marseille Desai and Alessandro Nesta. Okay. All right, and in left back will be Philip Lam. All right. Okay, my two midfielder, the defense, the midfield centre, defensive midfielder is going to be Marcos Sena and Javi. Hmm. All right, in attacking midfielder, I'm going to put Zidane. Okay. On the right will be Luis Figo. On the left, I'm going to put Lucas Podolski. And in centre forward up front is Fernando Torres. Okay. Okay. All right. I think we've all got a bit different squads this time compared to the last episode where we had pretty similar mean, squad. Yeah, I've got. What about you? What about you, Ras? Okay, so mine is also influenced by Italy uh, and Euro 2000. So I'm gonna go with three, five, two. So so to speak, lah. So mm. in goal, I got Toldo. Right wing back, I have Philip Lam. The three central defenders will be Carlos Puyol, Fabio Cannavaro, Alessandro Nesta. Left wing back Paolo Maldini. Just midfield. The team, la, they... No, not yet. Midfield oh. is Spanish. Midfield is Spanish. Midfielders will be Xavi and Iniesta, and then Zidane as the attacking midfielder. Forward will be Vanisteroy and Totti. I think ah uh, the only common factor there is Zidane. I think. <laughs> I think so. At, yeah, yeah. In at... all our squads, yeah. Yep, yep. Undisputed, I guess. And I mean, when I was selecting this team, it was very difficult because, you know, Spain had a lot of good players, Holland had a lot of good players, France, yep. um, Czech Republic, they all had a lot of good players in these three tournaments. So very difficult to just whittle down and get eleven players. Yeah, We could probably all- have different formations. Could have. For Name me, the twenty-two yeah, men squad, but, but you also needed to consider the story of the tournament, right? How far yeah. they went in the tournament. I mean, not yeah. not just namesake, like I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true. I mean, I I try to be balanced a bit by making sure that all three euros are covered, lah. And uh, mm. for the attacking midfielder position, I realized, you know, as much as uh, there were other players like uh, Deco, or maybe oh, yeah. uh, Deco, yeah, like Michael Balak and all that. But I think you know the most dominant mm. player in that position among all these three euros. Was when Zidane in Euro 2000. I think that was it is absolute peak. I always say this to people. It might sound controversial, but I think the peak Zidane for me was the Zidane that played for Juventus, not the Zidane that played for Real Madrid. Because in Real Madrid, you know, he had other stars that we had to share the ball with. 
with Juve, it was, it was him. It was in the everything went through him, and he was the master of the Juve side that was very successful in Italian football during the late nineties and early two thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good point. I think I agree with you on that as well. Yeah, because what he achieved at Juventus wasn't really matched at Real Madrid. Even Real Madrid, I think only the one Champions League trophy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because, because he, in fact, yeah, correct. You're right. In fact, I think uh, it was only after like one two season because uh, once Barcelona picked up, you know, Juventus and their Galacticos policy didn't really Real Madrid, bro. Success. Mm. Yeah, so you know, it was only like what between the first two two season, I would say. Because Zidane, yeah. Zidane needs a number ten, guys. He needed number ten. He wasn't wearing number ten in Real Madrid. He wearing number five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, he won the La Liga at Real Madrid, La Liga Supercopa de España, and Champions League. Yeah, that's about it. But of course, he won more at Juventus than he did at Real Madrid. Well, I think Lippi, who I think who molded him, I think to be aware whatever he was at the Juventus. So I think like what Steven said, I think he's the man. I think another I think still Lippi is the, but 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 that should be another discussion by myself. So Zidane, the player of the 2000s. Yes. Yeah, I I guess so. I think unequivocal. We have um, all agreed on that. He does shot lagi. I wouldn't say just the 2000s. Like I would say it's more between the mid 90s and the early 2000s because that era was definitely his his moment. Because after 2002, there was this guy called Ronaldinho lah. So you know he mm. pretty much took over the scene. Yeah, I think uh, Ronaldo will also have a huge shout for that. Player of the 2000s tag, late 90s and early 2000s as well. He he came about. So yep, yeah. I think we. I I feel we were all blessed that we watched so many great yeah. players play in the 90s and 2000s. We can we can be sitting here naming players till the cows come home, and it will not stop. But one thing I'm, interesting, I would say, yeah, uh, if you see. In terms of last time, I think from the defenders to the goalkeeper, a lot of exciting players. You know, Peter Cech, uh, even even the when the uh, Holland versus Italy, I think the Toldo was this side, and then Vendessa was the other side. Mm, yeah. yeah, quite the yeah. big names everywhere. Even defender, we're talking about Jabstam playing for MU. I think at that time was the uh, yeah. most expensive uh, defender of the year. Edgar Davis, defensive midfield. Yeah, but I think recently, besides Kante, I, I, can you actually think name any of these uh, defenders or goalkeepers who are actually shining? Kind of, yeah, kind maybe of, like uh, Van Dyke, maybe or Van Dyke. I mean, I mean, you 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 can't just plug. I mean, yeah, like, correct. I think I think it's a very good point, lah, but like, during that yeah. time, it's all very low hanging fruit. Ah, you can just plug and, and names very so. Ah. Now you have to think a bit, think a bit deeper, and then realize, okay, uh, is that player really that good? Ah, you know. Mm, yeah. Like, yeah. Nowadays, there's a lot of hype around the players. Mm, even mm. if Sane, you know, perform, even if Sane was star, but he even disappeared as well. So I'm not to say it's a bad player, but I think that 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 era we live, I think uh, I think that that entire position, even the coaches, made a lot of difference. I think thanks. I don't know, maybe mm. it's Pep a, or was it some kind of new football came in? A big eaten up. Yeah, a, a a big pool of stars in almost every position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. everybody exactly. eaten up really. And bear in mind, all all the three Euro winning teams from the Nortis era, they had this one particular player that always is underrated, the unsung hero who tends to do that little bit of things that sometimes we don't see in the naked eye, but it's a huge important, like Yuri Jokaev for that France team in two thousand, mm-hmm. like Marco Senna yeah, for that Spain yeah. team in two thousand eight, yeah. like in two thousand four. I mean, people will forget how good was Angelo Basinas was for that Greece yeah, team. Yeah, correct. Important. That's right. Oh, yeah, Adoros, yeah. Yodoro Zagarokis was yeah, Zagarokis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Karagunis. Yep. So, yeah, a lot of yeah. I think we're not very hard to find. I think. Yeah, that's true. So well, anyways, we have reached the end of our show, part two of the Euros done and dusted. Wonderful memories, guys. We've shared some fantastic memories from the nineties, from the noughties. And uh, we'll meet again on another show discussing a different topic. Until then, take care, stay safe. It's been a pleasure. Hey, th- yeah, thanks, Ras. Uh, thank you, Ras. Take, stay safe. Take care, man. All right, welcome. Thanks for having me on board, Ras. No problem. My pleasure. There was still time for a bonus question. 
And this question is with regards to England's golden generation which made its first appearance in an international tournament at Euro 2004. Wayne Rooney was the breakout star in that England team and was doing really well until he got injured in the quarterfinal against Portugal. Had he been fit, could England have gone further than the quarterfinals, maybe even the semi-finals or the final? My personal opinion is that if he had been fit, maybe, maybe England would have beaten Portugal because England looked really strong with Wayne Rooney in their team. What do you make of this, Elwin? Yeah, Ras. You know, uh, yeah, you yeah, you make a point there. They they could have basically gone further had he stayed fit. But but we need to understand something about this uh, you know English team that was basically taking part in this tournament and um, true enough yeah the golden generation and all that but you know this, this team was just basically full of drama you know I mean if you if you remember you know uh, before the tournament you know during the qualifying qualifying stage in that last qualifier against Turkey uh, you know basically uh, there was huge drama because you know Rio Ferdinand you know forgot to take a piece and uh, you know miss his drug test you know and of course <laughs> you know Gary Neville of course you know being a teammate and all that tried to rally the troops you know to go on strike and not play for the country you know I can understand you know all the camaraderie among these guys and all that for support for the teammate you know but to me all this was just nonsense because you know why do you need to sacrifice others when one guy you know clearly did a boo-boo right but you know as, as if you get into the tournament you know of course this English team you know it was definitely you know you can consider this yeah the golden generation because because you know, look at the squad. You have guys like Scholes, Gerard Lampard, you know, Terry, Sol Campbell, you know, Beckham as the captain, Michael Over, you know, even even guys on the bench like Joe Cole, you know, such huge potential there, you know. And then of course, you know, like like what you mentioned, you know, Rooney, you know, as an eighteen year old wonder kid, you know, you know, who at up to that point in the tournament, you know, was definitely making an impact because before this Portugal game he already had got he already has got four goals, you know, to his name already, you know. But uh, the the thing was, you know, I think the problem with, with this was uh, it was mainly Sven Goran Eriksson because you know he was quite rigid and he always chose to play a 4-4-2 you know and the issue was he always tried to fit Lampard and Gerrard in the middle of the field you know and to me not necessarily that was the best central midfield partnership for England not because uh, you needed to have a guy like Scholes in the middle but because of these two guys in the middle Scholes was basically forced to the left left hand side of the midfield and this was definitely not Scholes best position and uh, for such a talent like Paul Scholes you know uh, it, it was just a pity to see to see the way things panned out and all this you know and uh, you know Scholes despite being on the left hand side you know did, did have a you know a commendable tournament you know uh, but you know he could have achieved more and you know the the most beautiful thing was you know a day after they got knocked out you know he did you know that was the last basically we, we saw of Paul Scholes you know for the three lions when he decided to retire at just the age of 29 so you know uh, lots of um, things were happening here and there but but you know like this was definitely the introduction of Rooney and uh, what a star you would end up becoming right in the end now becoming England's uh, all-time top scorer I think not mistaken 53 goals for his country so yeah so basically this 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 my thought on the England 2004 squad yep and there will be scenes scenes of delirium here in Vienna for Spain put the long long wait behind them it was in 1964 that they last claimed the European Championship. They've done it again. Here today, Spain rule Europe. They are the champions.